It'll be a great uh, opportunity for you to check out both Bible study if you haven't been coming. And this will be a great time to get together with the choir and sing a song for Easter. That's Wednesday night, Bible study at 6, Fellowship Hall. And a choir will meet for their practice right here at 7. So we're rounding the corner of the season that we call Lent. And if you recall from the time we first got together at the beginning of the season of Lent, we recognize that this is a 40-day period, 46 days actually, 40-day period where uh, we remove something from our lives in a hope that that sacrifice might draw us closer in relationship with Jesus. Those 40 days represent the 40 days that Jesus spent sacrificing in the wilderness uh, and fasting his, the time of his temptation. So Lent, this season, right before the resurrection, is all about sacrifice. Today, I'd like for us to look at sacrifice and this concept of sacrifice. And to study this, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to t- look at two different stories from the Bible. And I'd kind of like to look at them back to back. And I think if we put these stories next to each other, we'll actually see uh, some commonalities in the two stories. My story today, this story today, it's not my story. The story today is about a young lady uh, from the town of Bethany who was a very, very good friend of Jesus. Her name was Mary. Mary has a brother named Lazarus. And Mary has another sister named Martha. Martha, Mary, and Lazarus of the town of Bethany. They're very, very, very close friends of Jesus. Now, not much is known about Mary of Bethany. And some of that is because she shares a very, very common name with other women at the time. Mary. It's a very, very, very common uh, biblical name. Some folks want to conflate uh, Mary uh, of, with other Marys in the Bible, Mary of Bethany with Mary Magdalene. A lot of people want to make those two Marys to be the same Mary. They're most certainly not. Uh, despite the confusion about her name, however, it is certain that she shared uh, one commonality with other women that we read about in the Bible, and that is at this particular time, women were not treated with the same level of dignity and respect that men were. They were not seen as equal creatures of the human race created in the image of God, just as their male counterparts were thought of. But one day, Mary of Bethany met a man that treated her differently. Maybe for the first time in Mary's life, a male... From a male, she was shown honor. She was shown respect. He treated her with dignity and he loved her appropriately. And it so transformed this woman, Mary of Bethany, that she wanted to worship him in the most sacrificial way that she could imagine. Her extravagant act of worship completely confused everyone else in this story. So let's look at this story. We find it, today's version of the story in the gospel, according to the apostle John in the 12th chapter. And scripture says this, it's interesting to me, that six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, a few miles, not quite two miles, about a mile and a half north of the city of Jerusalem. So six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, in this part of John, John chapter 12, he hadn't raised Lazarus yet. John, when he writes this, he assumes you already know that story, and so he kind of puts that in parenthetically. This is at the home of Lazarus, and you probably remember he raised a guy from the dead named Lazarus. It's this guy, basically, is what John is saying Here in the first verse of chapter 12. There they, the brothers, the brother and sisters, gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those that was at the table with him. 
Now Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and then wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Now, before I go on, let me explain this perfume to you. This perfume, you've heard me say already, we, is so valuable, we find out later in the Gospels that it was valued at about a year's worth of wages. Just imagine what you make in a year and imagine it being that valuable. Now, why was it so valuable? Well, it was valuable because it was incredibly rare. It was incredibly difficult to come by. Ordinary women did not wear perfume because they couldn't afford it. She broke the jar, and then what does she do? She poured the perfume on Jesus' feet. She broke and poured. She broke and poured. Now, there were others, as we read on in the story, and when she does this, they freak out. Verse 4 says this, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, Again, he tells you, just you know, already know, the one who's about to betray him, that one. Judas said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this because he cared not about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and he used to steal what was put into it. Right? Judas and the others are saying, don't do this. Stop! Right? You can imagine, perhaps, this is something that costs a year's worth of money. You can imagine as she broke this alabaster jar open, it might have happened in slow motion, right? You, someone might have even tried to dive out for it, right? That is so valuable. Woman, don't do that. I would have never done that, Right? I would say, me personally, I would have said, no, 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 no. It's too valuable. Right? Give him a drop, maybe two drops. Let's sell the rest of it. We could split it up. We could feed the poor. It's exactly what I would have been doing. This act of worship is more extravagant than we could possibly imagine. Because essentially, what Mary of Bethany was saying to Jesus is I am giving you my whole life. I am giving you the most valuable possession I have. She's saying this gift of extravagance is so valuable. This represents my past. My whole life. This represents my future. I'm willing to give you my whole life, my past, my future. In other words, Mary of Bethany is saying, I am going to leave my past behind. Jesus, you have loved me so much that I'm going to break open the most valuable possession that I have. I'm going to break it and I'm going to pour it, all of it. In the most selfless, extravagant moment of worship that I can do. Broken and poured. That's our first story. The second story. In this story, uh, Jesus is having his last meal. He's gathered together with his closest friends. He knows what's coming. And he knows that he is in just but a few short hours going to give his life on that Roman cross. And this is how the gospel according to John Mark tells the story. Chapter 14, verse 22, Mark says this. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And what did he do? Then he broke it into pieces. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to it. And he gave it to them and they all drank it. 
And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. He said, He said, This is poured out as a sacrifice for many. It's broken. It's poured. Broken. Poured. My body is broken for you. My blood will be poured out for you. My jar is broken in an act of worship. And I pour it all out because I'm giving you everything I am and everything that I have broken and poured. Luke reports the same story. Mark was there, that his other disciples were there. Luke wrote about it. He told the story in almost the same way, but he added and picked up on something that Mark didn't point out in his writing. This is what Luke said about it. In Luke, the 22nd chapter of his gospel account, the 19th verse, he said basically the same thing. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and there it is again, right? He broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. And then what does he say? He says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, what is this? Most of us would agree that as followers of Jesus, we gather together, we will here in just a few moments, we gather together and we take the Lord's Supper. We take bread and we take wine or we take juice, right? And we do this in remembrance of Him. We celebrate the death of And the resurrection of Jesus by doing this. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, all biblical scholars agree that this references celebrating communion or the Lord's Supper. Some scholars, though, argue that doing this means more than just that. And I tend to agree with them. Jesus said, do this. And what does, what does that mean? Well, certainly it means to celebrate and remember what he did. But perhaps it could also mean as he was broken, as he was poured out, we should do that as well as the ritual. Not just the ritual, but the life he lived. God calls us to live as Jesus lived and to love as Jesus loved. We are to deny ourselves. We are to die to ourselves daily so that we may live for His glory. When the gospel account says, do this, what if perhaps Jesus was saying, don't just do this act to remember me, but may you also be broken and poured out in such a way. Even as the Apostle Paul says, I pour, I'm poured out like a drink offering, giving everything I have for God's glory, broken and poured. Peter, who said, Jesus, I'll never deny you, denies him three times. On the third time, Jesus is looking at Peter as Peter is denying him, and Peter broke. Peter also, after being forgiven by Jesus after the resurrection, was chosen by God to be the guest speaker on the day of Pentecost. That was a pretty big gig. 3,000 people were born into the family of God that day. Those whom God uses the greatest are often those who've been broke in the deepest because God never, ever wastes a hurt. And there's somebody here right now, perhaps, you you don't want to be broken, right? You, You don't want to be, and that's okay. It's not, you don't have to pray as a follower of Jesus, right? Just to be smashed into bits, 
There, there are some, though, you could preach a, some, a sermon perhaps better than I can. Because right now you're in the middle of that breaking. What I would always say is just go ahead and fall. Fall on that rock and let it break. And when you get to that moment in your life, and life guarantees you will, you can either run from God, I'm sorry, you can either run to God, or unfortunately you can run from God. And my advice to you is just allow yourself to be broken wide open, fully depending on God. And let him do a healing work in you. And friends, understand this. This that I'm talking about here, this is not advanced Christianity. Honestly, this is Christianity 101. This isn't stuff for like monks and missionaries. It's not. This is like, I'm coming to Jesus. Break my body, God. Break my sin. Break me of me. So that I might serve you, Jesus, with all of my life. I surrender it completely to you. The gospel account is an invitation to come and die. Die to yourself so that Jesus can live through you. You see, when that woman, Mary of Bethany, broke open that jar, she poured it all out. Symbolizing, I'm giving you my whole Life, not just a part of my heart, not just a drop or two of my life. Broken and poured completely. When Jesus' body was broken, it was broken for you and it, it was broken for me. His blood was poured out that our sins might be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. I can't prove it, but I believe it. That this just just doesn't refer to a ritual. This refers to letting our lives be broken and poured out that we might serve Jesus with all of our hearts. And our mission at this church would be to lead each other to be fully dependent To follow Jesus wholly with our lives. Because I believe with all of my heart that that represents the heart of God. Reality is many of us are not fully devoted to Christ. But partially devoted to Jesus. We do it when it's convenient for us. If you find yourself ever being partially devoted to Jesus... Let me encourage you to consider praying a very dangerous prayer. God, break me. Break me so I could become fully devoted to you. Whatever it takes, God. I want to know you intimately. I want to serve you faithfully because I trust you, God. Do whatever it takes. Break me that I might know you. And there's some of us You trust God enough to pray that incredibly dangerous prayer. God, break me. Whatever it takes. And if that's you, more power to you. Go full on, right? Be all in. Don't just be 90%. Go all the way, right? Don't just go a little bit and say, well, that wasn't for me. Because it is. All I want for those of you that might not be ready, let me introduce you to perhaps some introductory words. Pick something in your life. And you can be praying, search my heart, O God. Show me if there's any offense in me for you. Whatever God shows you, that might be offensive to him, that's displeasing, that might that shouldn't be there, make that your broken prayer. Break me of that, O oh God. Right? Whatever it is, break me of my pride. Break me of my desire to control. 
Break me of my anger. Break me of my self-sufficiency. Break me of my lust. Break me of my impatience. Whatever it is, just start there. And when God breaks you of that, what you're going to see on the other side of brokenness is the blessing of God. Life's greatest breakings often lead to God's greatest blessings. So have the courage to start. It doesn't matter. Wherever you want to start and just say, God, break me of this. Because I trust that you're a good God. I trust you with this, God. At whatever level you want to start, just start. If you want to go all in and have no qualifications and say, break me wide open, God, I trust you with whatever it is, right? Do that because we serve an amazing God that we can always trust. We serve a God that does not guarantee that there will be no rain but guarantees that he will always be